Verse number 10, the Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So the Bible is saying that we're in a battle. It's not a, a battle with flesh and blood. It's not a physical fight, but it is a fight nonetheless. And there's a battle going on. There's a war going on. It's a spiritual battle. And he's saying you must put on the whole armor of God because if you don't, then you will not be able to withstand in the evil day. In order to be able to stand, you must take unto you the whole armor of God to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? That would be his tricks. So he's out to trick you, to fool you, to deceive you, to trap you, to ensnare you, to beguile you, and you must take unto you the whole armor of God so that you don't fall for it, so that you don't get sucked into it. He says, we wrestle against principalities. That's referring to devils, demons. He says, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. More repetition. Verse 11 says, stand. Verse 13 says, withstand. And then it says, stand. And then it says, verse 14, stand therefore. So three times it says stand. One time it says withstand. So God is making the point here that we need to stand our ground and not let the devil and his minions back us up. See, the last thing you want to do in a war is to be backing up and losing ground. You know, you want to stand your ground. You want to hold the position, hold the position, and not be backing off and giving ground to the enemy where they then get the momentum on their side and they begin to win the battle. We don't want the devil to win the battle in our lives. So we need to not give him an inch. We need to stand our ground and withstand and stand, 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 and only move forward, not be backing off and taking steps back. You see, a lot of people, they think that if they back off a little, they can sort of compromise with the devil, like they can do a parley with the devil, that they can basically come to a kind of an agreement where uh, they can find a balance in their life or peace in their life where they can get along with both God's people and get along with the wicked. But the truth of the matter is that the sons of Balliol, the sons of the devil, the children of the wicked one, as the Bible calls them, the tares of this world, they are implacable according to the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 1 that those that are reprobate, those that are the sons of the devil, those that are the children of Belial, it says they are implacable. Now that word implacable, if you're not familiar with it, it, me it comes from the word placate. And to placate someone is to appease them, right? So what does it mean to appease someone, okay? It's to give them what they want just to get them off your back, right? You want them to just leave you alone. You want to get them off your back. So you just kind of give them what they want, shut them up, and get them off your back. It reminds me of when I was a child, my older sister, Ronnie, used to babysit me. And my parents would go out on a date, and then my older sister, Ronnie, would babysit us. And she just wanted to talk on the phone a lot because she was a teenager. And she wasn't supposed to be talking on the phone when she was babysitting. She wasn't allowed to use the phone. So, but you know, she wants to talk on the phone. and. So sometimes we would go in and ask her for things because we knew that she would placate us and just kind of give us what we want just to get us up. So, it, Ronnie, can we have cookies? Can we have cookies? And she'd just be like, yes, how many can we have? How many? Just as many as you want. Just leave me alone. Shut the door. You know, she wants to be on the phone. So she would placate us by just giving us whatever the cookies we want and so forth. So that's what it means to placate somebody. It means you appease them, okay? If someone has a certain demand and they're coming to you with that demand, 
and they're they're not leaving you alone. And finally, you just say, just give it, give them what they want. You know, let, let's say you got a parking ticket or something. It's fifteen dollars, and you keep getting stuff in the mail. Fifteen dollars, fifteen dollars. Give us our fifteen dollars. And you're just like, fine. Here's the fifteen dollars. You're placating them. You're appeasing them. You're giving them what they want to get them off your back, right? Well, here's the thing about the reprobates, the, 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 the sons of the devil of this world. The Bible calls them implacable, meaning that they cannot be placated. They will never be placated. If you give them a finger, they take the whole hand. You give them an inch, they take a mile. They will not be placated. You can't just kind of throw them a bone and get along with them. No, they just want more. They just want more. So if the devil gets you to back up a few steps, he's all right, are you happy now? No, 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 he'll push you further. He won't be satisfied until he just will never be satisfied. But that's how it is in all areas of our life. When we start to compromise, it's just a slippery slope because if the devil can back us up a little bit, he'll back us up a little more, he'll back us up. Look, when you go from the King James to the New King James, as some kind of a compromise, you know what? It's only a matter of time before it's the NIV, before it's the ESV, where you go even more wrong on the version. Next thing you know, you're gonna be on good news for modern man or something. So you, you gotta just stand your ground, withstand. Now, how do we withstand? Well, we gotta have on the whole armor of God. Meaning that if any piece is missing, we're vulnerable. If there's any piece of the armor that's not there, we're vulnerable. Let's see what the pieces are. It says, stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth. This would be like the belt, the girdle, that which girds you. He says, the loins girt about with truth. You've got to have the truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. I believe that in this context, righteousness referring to right living, living right. He says, uh, the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith. Above all, meaning this is the most important component, the shield. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we have these different components. And if any of them is missing, then we're vulnerable, especially if the most important component's missing, missing, which is the shield of faith. Now, why is the shield of faith so important? Why is it the preeminent piece of spiritual armor? Because the Bible says that the shield of faith will allow us to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And faith is referring to believing God's word. Now, obviously, all of us have faith or we wouldn't even be saved, right? Because it, it took the faith in Christ that saved us to even get us saved. He's talking to Christians. He says in verse 10, finally, my brethren be strong in the Lord. He's talking to people that are in the Lord. There's brothers in Christ. And he's saying to you, you know, yeah, okay. I know you have faith that you believed on Christ, that you confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believed in your heart that God raised him from the dead. But that's not really, that doesn't take a lot of faith. That's just a beginning of faith. That's a start. Thankfully, it doesn't take a lot of faith to be saved. It just takes putting all your faith in Jesus to be saved. But just because you've trusted Christ as your savior, does that mean that from then on, you just are maxed out on faith all the time and you always believe every promise of God and you're always fully trusting in him all the time? No, because the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. Even after we're saved and we trusted Christ with our salvation, there are times when we lean on our own understanding instead of trusting in the Lord with all our heart. So with the shield of faith has to do with reading what the Bible says about any subject, any topic, any situation, and believing what God says and saying, you know what, here's what God said, I'm gonna trust that he's right and I'm not gonna lean on my own understanding. See, the devil is gonna throw all these fiery darts at you, these tricks at you. He'll try to get you to think that the world's way is better than God's way. And so we have to know the Bible well enough to even be able to trust in the word of God. You have to have something to trust in, something to put your faith in. 
And then we have to believe God's word, take him at his word. And if we do, we can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. It's like a shield that we put up. When we, when we read the Bible and it tells us, for example, that we're supposed to spank our children. You know, we read that, we believe that, we implement that. That's a shield right there. But we have that shield up that says, no, I know what the Bible says. I believe it's true. I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. Even if somebody comes along with a really slick pitch on why the world's way is better. You know, and the devil's wily. He can come at you with some tricky stuff and, and try to make you doubt yourself and doubt what you're doing in all areas of life. You got to hide behind that shield of faith quench those darts. But I'll tell you the one piece of armor that, that most people today are missing amongst God's people, thank God not in our church, but in most churches is the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. They're not prepared to preach the gospel. They don't have that preparation of the gospel of peace. They're not prepared. I mean, you could, you could throw a situation in their lap where they have the chance to witness to someone. They wouldn't even know what to do with it. They wouldn't even know how to do it. You see, by going out soul winning every single week, you're keeping your sword sharpened. You got your soul winning skills sharpened. When somebody comes along that you need to preach the gospel to them, you're ready to go. I mean, this is just another day at the office for you. You've done this over and over. You've wielded that sword for so many thousands of hours. It's a piece of cake for you. But you know what? What about when you're not a soul winner? What about when you don't do the door-to-door -door thing? Well, the opportunity comes along, oh, uh, 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 you don't know what you're doing. Or you do it wrong. You don't use the verses. You don't know the verses. You don't have a Bible with you. You can't quote them. You don't even know where to turn. You're flipping through the Bible. It's in here, it's in here somewhere, you know. The person loses interest or thinks, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to go ask... I'm going to go ask my buddy who's a, a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or a Roman Catholic or, you know, whatever. We need the preparation of the gospel of peace. The feet shod. The Bible says how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. So the gospel is always associated with our feet because we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, and that involves your feet going out there, getting out there and doing it. We need to be a soul winner. If you're not a soul winner, if you don't win souls to Christ, if you've never won somebody to the Lord, you're vulnerable. You're exposed right now. You say, well, I've never won somebody to the Lord myself. You are exposed. You do not have the whole armor on. Imagine going to battle with all the armor, but you're barefoot. Now, any soldier could tell you, and I've never been in the military, but any soldier could tell you that your footwear is a critical component of your gear. The socks, the shoes, the boots. I mean, it's critical. You, your feet can destroy you. If, you're, if you don't take care of your feet, you don't take care of your shoes, you don't take care of your socks, that could literally end the battle for you. You might not even get to the battle. And think about this. When you're in a battle, I mean, you're, <laughs> you need every advantage you can get. You don't need to be out there barefoot. There are a lot of hazards. There are a lot of things that can go wrong on a battlefield. There are a lot of things that could, could hurt your feet. And, and that, you know, going to war is not a time that you want to be found barefoot. But today, 99% of Christianity is barefoot today. I mean, look, look at all the Baptist churches and how many of them do soul winning. And it's not, and look, just because they say soul winning on the website, unfortunately, that's not always the case. Because you know what happens when you show up? You show up and it's a barefoot style soul winning. It's a soul, you know, and here's what I mean by that. It's a tract on the door. It's a door hanger. Or it's just an invitation to church. Just, hey, I just want to tell you about my church. Hey, just want to invite you to my church. Hey, hope to see you there. There's no preparation of the gospel to be preached. It's a barefoot style soul winning. Instead of having the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel peace. That's 99% of, and I'm talking about people that are actually saved. They have not even got their shoes on. They're not ready to go. They're not ready to go. The Bible says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me 
that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So Paul's saying, pray for me that utterance will be given unto me. Utter means to speak words with your mouth to open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So look, if the apostle Paul felt that he needed this prayer, pray for me to have boldness, pray for me to have utterance, you know what that tells me? That tells me that there's a tendency to quit soul winning. Even for a great man of God like the apostle Paul. Even for me, even for you, even for other great soul winners that we admire, we need to make a point to stay soul winning. Because there's a, there's a tendency not to give utterance. And there's a tendency not to have the boldness to get out there and do it. So we need to make sure that we take heed unto that piece of equipment, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The Bible says that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. What does it mean to be bold? It means to be courageous. The opposite of this would be timid, shy, being bold. Now, we don't want to be rude or obnoxious. When we talk about being bold, we're talking about being fearless. Amen. And by the way, when you go soul winning, boldness is one of the best attributes you could have as a soul winner. Again, we're not talking about being obnoxious, being rude, being a jerk. I'm talking about boldness. Now, you say, well, what do I do? How do I get boldness? Well, number one, you pray for boldness. That's what the prayer request is here. You pray for boldness. And also, you just go soul winning a lot and the boldness will come. Because when I first started soul winning, I didn't have a lot of boldness, but at least I was getting out there and doing it. And you get out there and do it and you, you grow in boldness over time. You pray for boldness, you grow in boldness, you get around others who are bold, the boldness rubs off on you. And look, the reason that this makes you an effective soul winner is that when you show up to a door and you're scared and you're timid and you're really shy and awkward, it tends to make people uncomfortable. They feel that shyness or timidity or awkwardness. And I've noticed that when I get around people that are really awkward, it makes me feel a little awkward. And I'm not a shy person at all. But I get a little awkward or weird around people because because that it's like we tend to mirror the people around us. So if you show up to a door and you're confident and you're bold, and you're not like apologizing all over yourself for even being there, <laughs> then, you know, I, I went soul winning in some, in some of the southern states and sometimes my soul winning partner was so, uh, I don't know, just falling all over themselves to be polite and apologize. I was just wondering like, is it just because I'm not used to being in the south, people are just really polite here? Or is this just too much polite? Cut to the chase, you know? So I wasn't really sure, I'm still not sure. But the, the, the point is that, you know, at least for Arizona, yeah, you wanna show up, and, and look, again, I'm not saying to be arrogant, to be prideful, to be obnoxious. You gotta be able to differentiate these things between boldness. You could be bold and still be me. You can have both of these attributes, and you gotta learn how this works. But what I'm talking about is when you go up to the door and you have confidence and you're looking them in the eye and you have the boldness, then basically that makes them more comfortable to talk to you. And it makes them feel like, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. This guy's got, this guy's on a mission. This guy's got something to say. Not like, oh, well, you know, you wouldn't want to hear the gospel, would you? <laughs> yeah, you want to get, and, and, and look, another thing to keep in mind is that even though sometimes when you go soul winning, people act like you're a disturbance or, or you're a pain in the neck or leave us alone, or, right? I mean, some people act like, you know, oh, you're bothering me. But don't let that get to you to where you actually start to believe that you're a pain in the neck or that where you actually believe that, that you're actually somehow imposing on them. You're not imposing on them at all. They're on their way to hell. You've got the good news. They're dying of a terminal disease and you've got the cure. So don't get this attitude like, oh, well, I feel so bad, you know, because it was dinner time. Look, the bottom line is you have every right to be there. The God of the universe sent you there. You're an ambassador for Christ. So if you're an ambassador for Christ, 
You don't, I mean, you think ambassadors from foreign countries are like, you know, is it all right if I sit here? When they show, you know, let's say they show up to meet with the president or they show up to meet with members of Congress or something. Like, I mean, I'm really sorry to take your time right now. It, they're not, that's not, they, they, look, they represent an important force, an important power. They're, they're there for an important reason. They have every right to be there. And that ought to be our attitude when we're solo. And again, look, if people don't want to hear it, then it's, hey, have a great day, see you later. There's no reason to force it down people's throat because you'll end up just wasting a lot of time with people that aren't interested. I'm looking for people that are interested. If people aren't interested, great, then I can just get to the next door faster. Great, thanks for not wasting my time. You know, but the point is you need to be bold. You need to be courageous. And you don't want to trim the message because you're afraid to offend them. Like, well, I don't want to bring up hell. It needs to be ad ad addressed, it needs to be brought up. But a lot of people won't bring up anything negative like that because they're just so afraid of offending people. That's the lack of boldness. He says in verse 21, but that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that, he, that ye might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And that, you know, don't just read over that because that's the closer. That we ought to love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. What, what does sincerity mean? It means that we're for real. We ought to have real deep love for Jesus Christ in our hearts. And this is a special blessing that Paul is giving. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, amen. So if you want, you know, there's a special blessing for those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in all sincerity, meaning deep down in the bottom of their heart, they really love the Lord Jesus Christ.